do is open your Bibles to the book of Luke. If you are new to the Bible, you can find Luke by looking in the table of contents. Luke is in what's known as the New Testament, which are the books that are written after Jesus came to earth. It's three books in, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We've been in a lengthy series in this book. Um, Luke wrote this for a man named Theophilus, who actually, like us, had not been present with Jesus when he walked this earth. And so Luke had a bunch of people who were eyewitnesses of Jesus, who, who were there with Jesus. He, he compiled this, this account so that Theophilus could know who Jesus truly is and what Jesus taught. And we have ancient manuscripts that have been preserved for us for today, and so we know that what we're reading today is what was written back then. And so we've been calling this series, Jesus Unfiltered. Because this is what Luke is giving us. He's given us an unfiltered view of Jesus, stripped away from all that man-made tradition and religion have added over the years. And last week we saw Jesus teaching his disciples and consequently teaching us how we are to pray. And I don't know about you, but I find it very helpful and encouraging that Jesus found it necessary to teach how to pray. Because guess what that means? We don't naturally know how to do it. You know, if you feel like prayer is something that's hard for you, well, that's okay, it is. Jesus said this is why he had to teach us how to do it. It's not something that comes natural to us. It is something that we need to be instructed by the Savior on how to do. And so last week we studied the famous Lord's Prayer. Um, And we saw that that prayer is not necessarily giving us specific words to rotely say, But in each word that our Savior chose, he was teaching us something profound about what all our prayers should say. Um, Last week, we kind of looked at a framework for which, a template, if you you will, for which we should pray. This morning, though, we're going to look not at the content of prayer, but as we come to Luke chapter 11, we're going to read verses 5 to 13, and we're going to see what's more like the manner of prayer. The manner of prayer. It's how should we think? How should we feel? What should our attitude be in prayer? Are we to be shy and timid? Are we to have doubts and to feel reluctant? I know I can all be those things sometimes when it comes to prayer, but but here's what Jesus wants to teach us this morning. Here's what we're going to see as we study these verses. I'm going to give away the punchline, and then we'll read God's Word, and I'll show us how we get this. Here's, Here's the punchline. How should we pray? We should pray boldly, because God is good. How does God want us to pray? He wants us to pray with boldness because we believe in His goodness. That's what He's going to teach us through Luke 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 5 through 13. Let's turn our attention to God's Word. This is Jesus speaking to His disciples, and He says, starting in verse 5, He said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impetus, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Let's pray and ask for God's help. God, I pray you just come and that these words that you spoke 2,000 years ago, you would just make come alive to our hearts today. There's a reason that you had, out of all the things that you taught, there's a reason that you had this specific teaching preserved. And there's a reason that each one of us is in this room right now to hear this specific teaching taught. And so God, I pray you just help, help us have open hearts and open minds. May we receive from you what you have for us today, and would you build us up in our faith, Lord. 
God, I pray for people here who have questions about their faith or exploring their faith. I pray you'd help them to be open as well. I pray they would feel safe here, um, Lord God, and, uh, and that they would continue to ask good questions about who you are. Lord, please build your church today through the preaching of your word. And not just our church here at Christ Church, Lord. Please build your church, your universal church throughout the world. And particularly, Lord God, throughout this city that we love in Philadelphia. Lord, I want to remember in particular Grace City Church in Frankfurt. I pray that you would bless them as they meet today. I pray that you would add people to their numbers as they meet today. I pray you would strengthen Pastor Stephen as he preaches today. Bless that church and prosper it for the glory of Christ in the Frankfurt neighborhood. Put this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God wants us to pray boldly because he is good. And I think this passage kind of lays out three ways that we see God being good. We see God being a good friend. We see God being a good giver, and we see God being a good father. Let's, let's make our way through this passage. Point number one, we are to pray boldly because God is a good friend. Jesus starts this teaching on our attitude about prayer with giving an illustration. And it's hard for us to immediately connect to this illustration since it's separated from us from about 2,000 years of history. But in order to get what's going on here, we have to understand something about the ancient Near East culture. In that culture, one of the chief values was hospitality. Who you were as a person was in large part judged based upon how well you did in welcoming people into your home. Welcoming people into your home and being hospitable was seen as a sacred duty. And a big part of welcoming people into your home was being able to give them something to eat. Italians would have done really well in this ancient Norris culture. Sit down, manja, manja, you know. I love being here in South Philly. Um, but this man had a problem, right? Jesus starts telling a story about a guy who has a problem. Someone has shown up at his home, and he has no food to share with them. And we have to understand, Jesus is describing a crisis, it's not like you could just run down the street to lo- lo- you know local bodega and grab you know whatever he needed. There's no corner stores back there. He 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 needed food to give, but he did not have any food to provide. And this was potentially an incredibly embarrassing situation to have someone come in your home and not to be able to offer them food would have been as embarrassing in that culture as in our culture jumping into a swimming pool and losing your bathing suit. It's a personal story that I'll share for another time. Um, <laughs> This man is in crisis. He's in crisis. He's out of food, but he needs to show hospitality. And so what does he do? He goes to his friend's house. And again, we have to get the culture here. This is not a suburban setting where you'd have to get in your car and drive down your 100-yard driveway and drive 10 minutes to the next person's house. No. Back in the ancient years culture, people lived very much like how we live here in the city. They lived right next to each other. They lived right next to each other. And so... um, it, but instead of having homes where you would have at least two floors, all homes would be on one single floor, and it'd be you know just one large room. And so in that room, you would do all your cooking, you would do all your eating, you would do all your living, and you would do all your sleeping, all in that one room. You thought you had p- space issues in your townhome. Um, and since indoor space was so limited, during the day, doors would actually be left wide open. It's a very communal culture. People just go in and out of each other's homes all the time. But once it was nighttime and you closed the door, that was the sign that it was now private. That your home was, was closed for the evening. A closed door was like hanging the do not disturb sign you know, on your hotel room outside your home. And so the fact that this man is going and he's knocking on a closed door is a really big deal. And the response he gets makes a lot of sense. It says, when he knocks on the door, what's going to happen? He says, do not bother me. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot give up and give you anything. Again, you got pictures. It's one room, and the kids have just gotten to sleep. Any parent knows how big a deal that is. The last thing this man wanted was some neighbor coming and banging on his door. Yet, Jesus says in verse 8, I tell you, though he will not give up, get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will give him, uh, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. 
Webster's Dictionary defines impudence as cocky boldness. This man had a need, and so he went to his friend with his need. Without qualification, without apology, he went boldly. He went with a certain cockiness almost, like, hey, I'm knocking on the door and I need you to do this for me. And what was the basis of this man's request? What made this man think that he could knock on this door and do this thing? We're given it in verse 5. He said, friend, lend me three loaves. This man came boldly on the basis of his friendship. He said, of course this guy's going to hold me. Of course he's going to help me. I'm his friend. And so he came to the door, and, and even the door was shut. He, he knocked anyway, and his request got answered because he had dared to be so bold. Now, Jesus' point here is not to say that God is a reluctant friend who only goes to the door if we just know how to knock loud enough. He, he's not saying that we have to bang and bang on the door of heaven to get God to answer. No, his reasoning here is from the lesser to the greater. Right? He's saying in verse 5, which one of you, which he's trying to get him saying, like, any of you would do this, right? He's trying to get agreement with them. Any of you, even if you were annoyed, if someone came and knocked on your door, the boldness of that friend would get your attention. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. And his point is, even if you do that, albeit reluctantly and begrudgingly, but even if you would do that, how much more so will God? How much more so will God answer us? when we come to him with our requests. Commentator Norvo Gelden Hughes says it this way, if even an imperfect human being, notwithstanding the inconveniencies to which he is put, will rise at midnight to give a friend what he needs if he comes and asks him for help, how much more will God listen to the sincere prayers and supplications of his children who are really in need? Jesus' point is that God's an even better friend than we are. He's an even better friend than we are. And so how much more would he answer us when we go to him boldly in our need? Perhaps in Jesus' mind is teaching this and using the story. He's remembering Proverbs 18.24, which says, There is a friend who sticks closer than even a brother. That's God. He's our friend, even closer than a brother. And remember what Jesus taught was the greatest sign of God's friendship. In John chapter 15, Jesus says this, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And he says, you are my friends. You are my friends. Friends, God has proven his friendship to us by taking care of the greatest need that we have. Our greatest need that we have, the crisis that we all find ourselves in, is that we have a debt against God. Our God has given us life to live for Him, but instead we use that life to live for self. And so God's justice requires that He take back the life that He gave. And so we are in crisis. That is our greatest need. Our greatest need is for salvation. For God to come and to forgive us this debt we have. And this is what Jesus has come to do. He came to give his life for our life. He is our friend who proved his friendship by giving his life for ours. By taking on the debt that we deserve. By taking on our debt of death. Dying on the cross for our sins. And then rising to new life to prove that he had accomplished our salvation. And so there's no greater love than the love of Christ. There's no greater friend. And we are invited to come to God on the basis of the friendship that he has established with us through Christ. We are invited to come and be bold in our prayers. We do not have to be shy. We do not have to be hesitant. We do not have to wonder if God is somehow reluctant No, we are to come boldly to our God in heaven who says he is our good friend. And and this friend in the story, was he was put out because his neighbor came at midnight. It was an inconvenient time. The friend we have in heaven, we know there is no inconvenient time because he never sleeps nor slumbers. There's no midnight for God. 
We can come whenever with whatever. He is always our friend. And he wants us to come with boldness. And so God is a good friend, and so we should pray boldly as we believe in his friendship. Point number two, not only is God a good friend, but God is a good giver. It's what Jesus lays out in verse 9 and 11. He makes it clear. This is not going to be a hopeless endeavor as we knock on the door of our friend in heaven. But he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now it's important to note that each one of these verbs that Jesus uses here, ask, seek, knock, it, it really stresses the idea of specificity. Um, Alistair Begg says it this way, the verb here for asking is not some vague, half-hearted request, but is the asking of an engaged mind and a focused will. Right? And when you seek something, you, so you see someone like looking around, you ask them, what are you looking for? They don't just say, oh, I'm just looking. It's like, no, you're like, they tell you what it is that they're looking for. To seek something means that you have something in mind that you're after. If you're knocking, what are you doing? You're knocking on a specific door. Each one of these verbs gets at the idea of specificity. God's point here is he does not want us to beat around the bush when we pray to him. He doesn't want us to have all these qualifiers and kind of circle the plane for a while. Listen, God's got a lot of things going on. Get to the point. He wants to know specifically what it is that we are asking. He wants us to ask. He wants us to seek. He wants us to knock. knock. He wants us to express the question that is on our heart. He already knows what's on our hearts even before we ask, but he wants us to verbalize it so that we can experience him meeting us in our need. Listen, friends, if we're too scared to ask for God for things specifically, then we are never giving God the opportunity to answer us to specific prayers. I think how often we can feel I don't see God moving in my life, is it because you are actually not asking God to move in your life? If we want to see God move and act in specific ways, we cannot be shy and holding back how we want God to move. God wants us to come not with vague generalities, not with a bunch of flowery phases to kind of butter him up, flatter him, and then get him to, you know, to listen. No, he wants us to cut to the chase and to be honest. He wants to say it like it is. God would do very well here in Philadelphia. That's what we do, right? We just say it like it is. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to be specific. And as we do this, he wants us to also be persistent. The verbs here, again, ask, seek, knock, they're all in the continuous tense, which means that there's things that we are to continually be doing. Jesus is saying, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. His point is, be bold and don't give up, but keep pressing in. And why do we keep pressing in? Why do we keep being persistent in prayer? Is it because God is reluctant and we need to kind of force him into going our way? No, he promises that if you ask, you will find. God isn't trying to, he isn't this slumbering being that we need to wake up and rouse through our prayers. No, God wants us to be persistent in our prayers, not for his sake, but for our sake. God will often use persistence to teach us devotion. God often wants to use our persistence to teach us what it means to truly be devoted to Him. If God gave us everything we prayed for in the exact moment that we prayed for it, which He does sometimes, but if he did that every time, it would just become a transactional relationship, wouldn't it? I put my prayer in, I get this out. God would become our divine ATM. And that would rob us of the relationship that he actually wants to have with us. He wants us to know him. And part of knowing someone is the ability to trust. Can't have relationship without trust. 
And so often God calls us to be persistent in our prayers. He doesn't meet us in the exact moment, not because he is being mean and trying to delay unnecessarily, but because he wants us to be able to trust him. And he knows it is better to learn the lesson of trust than it is just to have him be our ATM. God often wants to use our persistence to teach us devotion. But then we do that not in a way that's futile, not in a way that we're just like, all right, I keep you know, persisting, I keep going, and it just feels like we're on some kind of treadmill where we just keep running, running, and we're actually making progress, right? God, God calls us to persistence, but he does it with a promise of answer. He, he is saying, this is a real promise, ask and you will find. That is God's promise to us. Now, it's important to, to, to note at this point, is Jesus saying that whatever we ask for, we get? Is he, is he trying to teach us here, which is becoming more and more a popular teaching in American culture, that if we just name God's promise and claim God's promise, we get God's promise? Is, is that what he is saying, that you get whatever it is that you ask for? Well, we have to keep in mind that Jesus, as he's telling us, ask, we have to keep in mind that he's already told us what we are to ask for. Right? We've split this up into two different sermons from last week and this week. But for Jesus, this is all one teaching. Right? He's talking to his disciples in one continuous uh, lesson, if you will. So in verse 2 and 4, when he gives the Lord's Prayer, he's already told them what he wants them to be asking for. He's already told them that this is how you should pray. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. And lead us not into temptation. Right? Jesus already told, has already told us what it is that we should be asking and seeking and knocking for. Right? And so this isn't saying, hey, go to the local car dealership and pray over a car and God will give you that car. Friend, that is just bad theology. That is not what Christ is saying here at all. He is saying that he wants us to be persistent in prayer for these things that he has taught us to pray for. He wants us to ask for his name to be hallowed in our lives. He, he wants us to seek his kingdom. He wants us to knock on his door for our daily needs. This is not a blank check to get wherever we want as we just name it and claim it. No, this is asking and seeking and knocking for the things that God says will only truly satisfy us in our hearts. Now, this does not mean that we don't come for our needs. Certainly we come for our needs. Again, we want to be specific. God, I, I want you to move. Would you move and answer this prayer in my heart? Would you do this in my life? God, I pray for this loved one to be delivered from their addiction. Lord, I pray for this relationship to be healed. God, I pray for you to provide financially, right? We can pray specific prayers. We're, we're to pray for our daily bread. That's what Jesus says. We ask for what we need, but we ask with open hands. Because again, as Jesus taught, and we looked at this last week, before we ask for our needs, what are the first two requests we are to make? Hallowed be your name and your kingdom come. And that's always our greatest need. The greatest need we have in our life is for God to be glorified in life. You can have every single care in your life removed, and you'll never be satisfied by it. You won't. Um, I deal in my other role as, as a chaplain of a major professional baseball team. I deal with people who have not a care in the world. They have all the money and fame and whatever they want at the snap of their fingers. And let me tell you, it doesn't leave you satisfied. It doesn't. It doesn't. My counseling calendar with them shows me that it doesn't. It doesn't leave you satisfied. They have all the same problems that we do. Because our hearts were made by God to crave the glory of God. And it's only His life, His name being hallowed in our lives. It's only Him and His kingdom coming and ruling in our hearts. That's the only thing that will truly give us what we seek. And so, as we come to God boldly in prayer, our, our, we should always be praying, God, would you be glorified? But as we pray, God, would you be glorified? We can ask specifically for God to be glorified in these ways. And so I pray, God be glorified through healing me my Crohn's disease. I pray for that. I pray for that. But I want to pray for that with open hands. 
goes, what if God wants to glorify me, not through healing me of my Crohn's disease, but through me suffering with my Crohn's disease? What if that's the greater testimony that God wants? I don't know. I certainly am hoping for healing. But I want my heart, and I think we should all have hearts that we bring as we bring requests to God. We don't bring requests to God with closed fists. You must do this. We bring them with open hands. God, would you please do this? But ultimately, would you glorify yourself? What, what, are, you, what are you symbolizing when you're putting your hands up like this and you're, you're raising your hands to heaven openly? It's a sort of sign of surrender, isn't it? Universally throughout history. People ask sometimes, me, I go to church, me, they come from a more traditional background. Why do you raise your hands in singing? This is a sign of surrender. This is a sign of surrender. It's a sign of God, it's you. God, I want you. I'm surrendering to you and your purposes in my life. This is how God wants us to pray. He wants us to come with our bold requests. He wants us to come with the needs that we have in our hearts. Again, we looked at this last week. He's our, he, he's our Father who loves us, and so He wants to hear from us. We, we come, but we don't come saying, God, now get in line and do what I want. No, we come and we say, God, your kingdom come. I have this need. This is my daily bread that I want. But Lord, as I bring that to you, my first request is always your kingdom come. And so I bring this request with an open hand. I bring this request with an open hand. Surrender is how God wants us to pray. And that does not mean that we hold back. That does not mean that we are trying to hedge our bets in place in case God doesn't come through. No, we are to pray with boldness, with clarity. We are to believe in the power of God. But then we're to trust God that His answer is going to be even better than the request we are making. That, that's what really what God's promising to us here. When He says that ask and you will find... We might not necessarily find what we are asking for, but we will find what God wants us to have. And God is a much better giver than we are askers. We might ask for something, and God might say, no, I'm not going to give you that because I have something even better. I have something even better. This is the incredible thing about being a Christian. It's the incredible thing about being a Christian. You know, we know that life is not in vain. We know that there's always purpose and meaning behind everything that's going on. And so no matter what is happening to us, we know that there's a God who is beyond us, who is bigger than us, and He is working all things out for us. And so we pray. And so we pray, not out of religious duty. We pray boldly. We pray with big dreams and and big needs in our hearts. We pray because we believe prayer actually makes a difference, and God is on the move. And he will answer our prayers far better than we even know how to pray. Now, a valid question is, well, how do we then process prayers that do seem to go unanswered? Good prayers that seem to go unanswered. What what, what about the times that we feel like God is, is distant? What should we do then? Friends, I think what we need to do then is we need to remember this perspective. God is is not holding back because He is reluctant. No, He wants us to learn the grace of devotion through persistence. But He wants us to keep praying boldly. He wants us to keep coming and praying and believing. And He wants us to do that with this perspective. While we might not get every answer we want here on earth, there is no Christian in heaven who has regrets about how God answered their prayers. I think sometimes we think, God, you're not giving me what we're asking for, and our pro- God wants to say to us, you're trying to stop me before the story's over. God might not be giving you what you're asking for right now, but when you get to the end of your story, you will see that he's actually giving you far more than you even asked for. He's a better giver than we are even and ask her, no one gets to heaven and has regrets for how God handled their prayers on earth. I think a story that illustrates this is, to me, very much the story of, of Jim Elliot. Maybe you're familiar with that name, maybe not. But Jim Elliot was a, this young firebrand missionary. He excelled in his theological studies. He was a leader amongst his peers, a, a rising star, if you will. And he had this audacious dream to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the most dangerous area in the world. 
It's this tribe of headhunters called the Huronai. And it, his, his hope was to go and to, from reaching those people to see God would do something so dramatic and so amazing that that whole region would be changed and from that God's glory would spread throughout the earth. And so he was praying for that. He was asking for that. You read his journals and he's a man who knew a lot of boldness. But if you know the story, after years of preparation, Jim Elliot finally makes contact with this tribe for about 10 minutes before he is speared and killed by them. And so the question is, did God answer his prayers? He was asking for something. Did he find it? And friends, the answer actually has to be yes. Because his story has gone on to inspire countless numbers of ministry of missionaries. Some of which went back to the very tribe that had killed him. And they started reaching out and they started preaching the gospel to that tribe. And that tribe didn't listen to Jim Elliot, but they did listen to the next wave. And they did become Christians. And their story has now spread throughout the world as a story of the powerful transformation that Jesus Christ brings. And so God used Jim Elliot in ways that are actually far beyond what he could even envision. Jim Elliot is not in heaven regretting how God chose to answer his prayers. And so friends, if you feel like you have unanswered prayers, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Keep bringing those requests before God. Be honest and specific about what's on your heart. But do it with an open hand because God is always a better giver than we are eager even in asking. He's a good giver. And we can trust that he's a good giver. Because not only has he proven himself to be a good friend, he's also proven himself to be a good father. And that's our final point this morning. We ought to pray boldly because God is a good father. Father. Jesus in verses 11 and 12 asks rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions are questions where there's not actually an answer responded. Um, If you've been married for any length of time, you're very familiar with these types of questions that you can be asked sometimes by your spouse. You're not really asking if I look good in this. You just want me to affirm whatever it is that you have in your mind. Um, If you're not in a relationship, see me afterwards. I will save you years of pain by teaching you about rhetorical questions. Um, he asks these rhetorical questions. He says, what father amongst you, amongst you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will instead give him a scorpion? Right? The answer is obvious. No one's going to do that. No one's going to do that. No father gives something to their child when they come to them saying, hey, I'm har- hungry. And like, they're not like, you know, hey, here's a Chick-fil-A sandwich. And they put like some poison in it. Right? Like no one's doing that. And again, Jesus' point is to go from lesser to greater. He says in verse 13, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father? Now by calling us evil, Jesus is not saying that we're just these terrible people. No, he's saying in comparison to God and God's holiness, we're all evil. And he's like, even if you, who fail all the time, even if you know how to give good basic gifts like this, surely your heavenly Father does with whom there is no hint of impurity whatsoever. His point is that the Heavenly Father is far greater than our earthly fathers. That's why we should never allow our experience, which might be negative with our earthly fathers, to color what we think about the Heavenly Father. Our earthly fathers have nothing on our Heavenly Father. He's even a better father. And he has shown that he is a good father through giving us good gifts. One of the ways that God expresses his fatherly care to us is through giving good gifts. Anyone who has received a good gift knows the impact that can have on you. I'm a terrible gift giver, um, so I'll just be up front with that. First, I'm really bad at mem- uh, remembering people like dates, so I'm really bad with like remembering birthdays and things like that. I'm good with faces and names. I have a good memory overall, but for whatever reason, dates just don't stick in my mind. I hate numbers probably going back to, you know, the early days of doing math and being really bad at it. So, so I just, I'm, I'm a bad gift giver because I forget people's birthdays, and, and I just never know what to get people. I never know what to get people. Um, you know, I'm really good with my words, and so I have no problem. I can sit down and write a long, thoughtful card, but to pick out a, a, a present, I, I hesitate saying this, 
um, but sometimes you share stories that are so embarrassing, there's like no coming back, but I, 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 you know, I'll, I'll just go there, so I'm really trying to grow in this area, and so I'm like, you know what, I'm going to take my kids out, and we're going to get gifts for Angie, typically, you know, I'll write her a long note, and um, you know, actually, I, I write, like, there's a song that I write a new verse for to her every year, so I'm like, again, I'm good with words, I'm good with that kind of romantic gestures and things like that, but, like, knowing what to buy her, I have no clue. So we go to Target, and, and we pick gifts, and I pick out things that, that some clothes, that I think, oh, these look great on her, this would be great, and I bring them back, and, and I even got the, I think I got the, the, the right size down and things like that, and I come home, and she, she just looks at me, opens and looks at me, and goes, oh, bless your heart, and I'm like, oh, that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign. So apparently I'd gotten her all maternity clothes. <laughs> um, now, now, in my defense, they weren't baggy. They were like that new kind, like that stretchy kind. Like you can't tell just by looking at them, but the label clearly says it. And so, yeah, I'm just a bad gift giver. So, But you know, if, if you're not like me, if you've actually gotten a good gift, you know that, that there's just something that when pe- people give you something, you're like, wow, you really know me. You, you know me well. You must, you must really care about me. There's something about getting a good gift that just makes you feel appreciated, right? Someone's paying attention to you. Someone knows how to bless you. A good gift is an expression of love. But friends, our Father in heaven has shown us what a good Father he is by giving us a thoughtful an intentional gift that shows us that we are known and loved. He says, how much more, in verse 13, will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Friends, in this statement, Jesus is saying an explosive thing. He is crystallizing thousands of years of biblical revelation and bringing it all together. We can't really appreciate what he's saying here about how the Father is going to give the Holy Spirit without doing a little bit of a biblical survey. So just stick with me here for a moment. We have to understand what's going into this. We first see the Spirit mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. And so Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out form and void and was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so the Holy Spirit, we see Him present at creation, and not just observing, but no, in Job 33, 4, it says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Holy Spirit was an active agent in creation. And and He's active throughout the history of Israel. When Moses brought the people of Israel out of their slavery to Egypt, right? they they come to the Red Sea, Right? And there's no way forward. They can't get through uh, the Red Sea. And the Egyptians are fast on their heels because they regretted letting them go. And so the army is coming back. And so they can't turn back and move. And so what happens? We're told in Isaiah 63, 11, it says, Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make a name for himself an everlasting name? Friends, the Holy Spirit was present at the parting of the Red Sea. As Moses raised his right arm, it was the right arm of God that split those waters and brought his people forward to deliverance. And then after this massive victory and salvation, we know that Moses goes up to the Mount Sinai and and he just pleads with God to send his presence amongst his people. Exodus 33 says, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth? And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, The very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Friends, it was God's presence with Israel that distinguished Israel as his people. It was not the Mosaic law, nor was it other ethnic identity markers. It was the fact that God's presence was with them. Which as we continue to read in Exodus, what happens is God's presence comes and it, it dwells in the tabernacle, which was a temporary dwelling place. And they eventually come into the promised land and God's presence comes and, and he fills the holy uh, temple. Right? God's presence was with his people. But this incredible promise was made by the prophet Ezekiel. He says this, 
says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Or Ezekiel promised that this, this presence, this, this spirit of God that dwelt in the temple would not always dwell in the temple, would actually come to dwell in God's people. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterwards, thou pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Friends, this is incredible. Think about what God is, is prophesying and saying. The Holy Spirit is God, and it's how God makes his presence known. But when, when he was on the mountain, Moses had to be put behind a rock. Because God said, my presence will be with you, but you can't actually look at it or you will die. And, and the people of Israel could not approach the mountain and touch it or else they would die. Right? There had to be this special dwelling where God could, could be with his people, but also separate from his people so that they would not be consumed by his holiness. And yet, the prophets spoke about a day where that barrier would no longer be there. They spoke about a day where God's, God's presence would not dwell in a temple, but would dwell inside his own people. And we know as Jesus has come, Jesus came to bring that day to pass. We read this a few months ago as we were studying Luke chapter 3, where the prophet John said this about Jesus. He said, I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming. And the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Baptism, it means, it means immersion. And through Jesus coming, this prophecy of the Holy Spirit coming and immersing God's people is going to come true. Because through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for our sins, what happened when Jesus died on the cross in the temple? If you know the story, inside the temple was the Holy of Holies, which contained the presence of God. And when Jesus gave his life for our life, when we were forgiven by his death, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies was torn. Not how you would typically tear things from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. Because God was the one who was tearing the separation. There no longer remains anything between us and God. His presence no longer stays in the Holy of Holies behind a veil, but comes to anyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ. We come to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes and he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And what an incredible gift this is. Christian, do you know this morning you have the very presence of God in your life? You have the very presence of the almighty, omniscient, omnipotent creator of the universe, the transcendent being. His very presence is not just with you, but has actually been baptized into you. The presence of God dwells in us. The presence of God dwells in us. But I think we can forget that. I think we can be distracted from that. And yet how often is this presence of God, this Holy Spirit being in us, how often is this actually the answer to the prayers that we are trying to pray? Christian, do you pray and struggle with your faith? And do you wonder, I'm just not sure if I'm going to make it? The Holy Spirit gives you an answer to that. Colossians, I mean Corinthians 2, 1 through 22. God put his seal on us and has given us his Holy Spirit as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit assures us of our salvation. We're going to make it because he is in us. Do, do you pray and just sometimes feel distant from God's love and wonder how he could love you? I forgive my, I know maybe he forgives me, but I don't know if I can forgive myself. I don't know what that means. Oh, the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit is how we get to experience God's love. Do you, do you feel weighed down in life by worries, by stress, anxieties? Do you carry with you the weight of failed expectations, of regret? Shame and guilt? 
2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Literally, that word means there is removal of all burdens. The Holy Spirit frees us from the baggage of the past by letting us experience God's grace in the present and look forward with faith to the future. There's freedom in the Holy Spirit. Do, do you think sometimes that, man, change just seems impossible in my life. Uh, sin's hold on me just seems to be too tight. Galatians 5.16, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength to walk out life in a way that pleases God. Do you pray for good things to come into your life? Here's some good things. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who doesn't want more of that in their life? And those aren't behaviors that we just try to get better at. No, it says it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's all one thing. When you take a bite of the presence of God, He brings love into your life. He brings joy into your life. He brings peace into your life. He brings self-control into your life. It's all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is all that God has given to us in this great and incredible gift. And this gift that we're given, it's, it's not just a one-time thing. It's like we come and baptize in the Holy Spirit and then we just move on about our lives. No, we are told in Scripture to what? It says, walk by the Spirit. Walking is a continuous thing. It is something that you are repeatedly doing. Paul makes this very clear when he says in Ephesians 5.18, he says, but be filled with the Spirit. And that word be filled is, con is continuous. A more little translation is keep on being filled. Right? God wants us to be filled with His Holy Spirit again and again and again and again. We need Him to keep walking His way. And so we keep praying, Lord, I'm walking, would you keep filling? Lord, I'm walking, would you keep filling? This gift of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time gift. It's a gift that keeps on giving. What a good Father we have. That He would not only send Jesus to die for us, but through that would allow us the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit dwell inside of us. What a good Father He is. And the goodness of His fatherhood should make us want to be bold in our prayers. If we know who it is that we're praying to, then we will never hold back from what we're asking for. And so Christ Church, let's pray boldly. Because God is the good friend who is there for us. Let's pray boldly because He is the good giver who knows how to give better than we even know how to ask. And let's pray boldly because He is our good Father who's shown His goodness to us through giving the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us. Oh, friends, let's be bold in our prayers because God is...